Hey, everybody. A quick note before we get started. Today's guest, Elisa DiNapoli, is the author of the book Dare to be Seen, which helps people get over stage fright and performance anxiety. Elisa is offering listeners of this show a free copy of the book. All you have to do is go to elisadinapoli.com slash brine and you get the book. That's elisadinapoli.com slash brine, E-L-I-S-A-D-I-N-A-P-O-L-I.com slash Brian for a free copy of Dare to be Seen. Thank you for listening to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Funk, a musician, producer, educator out of New York. I'm an Ableton certified trainer. I just released a tutorial about expert volume automation in Ableton Live that will save you some trouble and help you avoid some of the common problems when you start automating the volume fader. I have a different approach for that. And it also comes with this easy volume rider effect rack so you can make these subtle changes with your automation to kind of boost little parts and get your tracks really balanced and full. I've also released a free Ableton Live pack called Dad's Dinosaur Friend, and that is a collection of instruments made from a Florida sandhill crane who sounds a lot like a dinosaur, at least in my mind. I made all kinds of instruments from keys, pads, plucks, even drums, and you're hearing a lot of those instruments at work in the background music right now. There's a free version that comes with three instrument racks, and you can get the full version with 10 instrument racks and 30 presets if you become a member of the Music Production Club. And the Music Production Club is where you get all my latest stuff. As soon as it's released, you get access to our community, you get tutorials, courses, all kinds of good stuff that will help you make better music. You can check all this stuff out at my website, brianfunk.com. Now, enjoy the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Funk. And on today's show, I have a special guest, Elisa DiNapoli. And Elisa is a life coach, an author, a hypnotherapist. She's an artist herself, a musician, and she is also the author of the book, Dare to be Seen. And what she kind of specializes in and that I'm excited to talk about, and I think a lot of us can get something out of this, is overcoming like performance anxiety and getting on stage, stage fright, and just releasing our music. Um, I know a lot of people have done the January challenge where they made music every day during the month of January. And maybe some of you are thinking about releasing that. You might have a little bit of the jitters. Um, I've been talking for a while about releasing a new album with my band and no one's heard the band yet. So we're all excited, but there's a little part of me still, like even after all these years that has that little bit of anxiety around releasing something. And Elise is here to help us through that, give us some pointers. So welcome to the show. Great to have you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's good to have you. Um, this is, I think, a big thing for a lot of people. You know, um, it's one thing to do your art, do your craft, like in your home, and the, you know, without anyone watching. Um, but to actually share it is a big deal. And I, I can remember even as a young kid, like playing my guitar, learning it in my room, but then feeling so different when I brought it out of my room, even in front of my family. It was kind of like, oh, what are they thinking? Is this, you know, there was just a kind of a weird feeling, so... I'm excited yeah, to I mean, hear some of your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's totally normal to feel, you know, a certain amount of anxiety um, when performing and uh, when sharing your music, of course. But um, when it becomes too much, when it becomes incapacitating, when it stops you from actually sharing the work, um, well, mm. that's when it becomes a problem, right? You know, because the thing is that, um, you know, as social animals, we want to be accepted. Uh, in the, the tribe, so to speak, you know, mm. this is just uh, part of our evo uh, our evo evolution, and um, and so it's uh, it's a threat to be rejected, or even mm. if we just imagine that we're being rejected, for our brain it doesn't make a difference whether we imagine it or whether it is real, because that's how our brain basically understands what's um, uh, to be avoided or not to be avoided. You know, what's a, a psychological uh, pain. Um, or not and that's basically um, 
It is based on either experience, so something that's actually happening to you where you are being rejected, or just imagining, simply imagining that you're being rejected for who you are. And then, so that's a threat. And so um, as much as it would have been in the past, you know, being thrown out of your tribe and being uh, put out there into the world to fend for yourself, I mean, that would be a real, <laughs> a real danger in the past. But um, we, you know, we haven't really... Um, you know, we, we are now modern individuals, uh, but it doesn't really matter for our amygdala, which is the alarm center of the brain. Um, for the amygdala, you know, if you start to imagine something as being dangerous, it is dangerous. So then you're going to have, a, you know, you're going to have symptoms of that, um, the fight or flight. Um, um, basically, you know, what starts to happen when you are uh, scared is you go into fight or flight, which is basically your body gets ready to fight the enemy, so to speak, or run away from, from the lion. But in this case, it's yeah. other people uh, and what they think, or what we imagine they're thinking. And so it's a real, you know, seen as a real problem, a real danger. And so we need to actually learn how to calm ourselves down, first of all, so that we can get out of this fight or flight state. And then there's a bunch of things we can do to actually... Uh, maximize our performance you know if this is about performing but even if it's not about performing it, it's about just pushing the button and sending the music out there you know that can be just as scary it's this moment of real panic of like oh what's gonna happen when i push the button and and everybody's gonna either like it or not like it and we we kind of put our self-esteem into that as well you know as like we identify with that outcome so rather than identifying with, okay, how, how, how am I satisfied? You know, am I satisfied with this uh, piece of production or not? You know, uh, we, we think we forget all about that and we just uh, attach our value or worth uh, to the response of other people, which is a very yeah. dangerous thing to do because, you yeah. know, um, some people out there are not going to like what you do. Even if you're amazing, it doesn't matter. That's very true. Even the most successful artists, you can get people that say like they're terrible. And it's like, I mean, they are yeah. objectively not terrible, but we yeah. all have like those opinions and we'll say things like well, that. Well, exactly. So. I mean, not everybody likes uh, Mozart, you know, not right. everybody uh, likes Prince. You know, we know that these, these are artists that are amazing, but not everybody likes them. That doesn't mean they're not good individuals or not worthy of love and acceptance, you know. Uh, of course they are, but this is something we need to remember, you mm. know. But what I'm trying to say here is not just a rational thing, it is an emotional response that comes from this very primal fear. Um, and so we need to actually calm our body down, first of all, before we can engage in positive self-talk. You know, because a lot of the time what you hear people say is, yes, you have to talk to yourself in a positive way, and that's fine. That definitely wor wor uh, works, but... Before you can do that, you need to be calm because when you're in a fight or flight state, actually what happens is that your um, prefrontal cortex, which is the part of your brain that um, deals with rational thinking, is actually inhibited. And you start thinking in black and white terms because, you know, if you think about it, if you were in a real dangerous situation, such as maybe there is a lion in front of you and it's trying to hit you, 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 you don't have the time to think, oh, you know, is this lion really dangerous or is it not really dangerous? You know, if you start thinking like that, you're eaten. You know, it's too late. So we're built to, to have this like really quick uh, answer to the situation. That works in a lion, you know, uh, if you, there is a lion there, but if it's instead something else, like an audience, well, then what can happen is that we, we are not thinking straight anymore. You know, we, we actually not. You can't think rationally anymore. Mm. And so in order to think rationally, we need to switch off the fight or flight. Um, kind of that, that, um, that switch. Mm. I like that you bring it all the way back to like an evolutionary thing um, because I think so much of our behavior is really there um, because our like biological evolution is so slow. I think it's hard for us to really understand, but we are essentially the same humans with the same DNA that we've been, I, th I think they say for like hundreds of thousands of years by now. And sure. meanwhile, our, our society and our cultures have evolved really fast. So we're kind of like lagging behind. And even though we don't have the lion in front of us anymore, 
the fears that we have might as well be the lion because those are like the modern day equivalents. Yeah, and yeah. and the, to point out the fact that um, just what you said about it as being like a survival thing in that, you know, if, you, if you're sitting there thinking logically, well, you got eaten, which means you did not have children, which means you did not pass on your DNA. So we are really descendant of the fortunate people that did kind of freak out and have that emotional reaction and leave and run. So it's it's in a way a strength, but I guess in this situation, you know, as far yeah. as some of this stuff goes, it doesn't play out the same way in our modern day. Yeah, and also there's another thing there as well that, you know, on top of this, which is totally normal, on top of this, there's um, the, the case of um, if actually you've had bad experiences where you have been rejected by people. So some kind of trauma, you know, and trauma doesn't have to be a big one. It could be like being laughed at when you were a kid and, and you were telling a joke in, in class uh, and nobody laughed, you know, or maybe everybody laughed at you because while you were trying to recite a poem or whatever, you know, that's a trauma for a child. And it basically means I'm not good enough. You know, the child thinks that. And so the problem with that is that then it adds on to this evolutionary fear and it becomes really debilitating because then you have the proof. You're like, oh, but you see, it did happen. And it doesn't matter whether you even remember this. You know, I mean, some people don't even remember it because, you know, uh, we have other things to think about during our adult's life. Since it's not like we think about our childhood all the time. And so then that can add onto it. And then on top of that, the third thing that can happen is that if you're a particularly um, anxious person, you know, you may be anxious in other areas of your life, you'll tend to uh, indulge your imagination into what if scenarios and, you know, worst case scenarios and, and catastrophizing it. And when you do that, like I said before, for the brain, it doesn't matter that that's just an imaginary situation of danger. It will process it as actual danger so on top of everything else it is you know layered so if you have all of these three things you'll have a very very bad performance anxiety and mm. so in that point you have to work on different levels you know you have to work on the anxiety level of like <clears throat> learning to realize that that's what you're doing and stopping it and actually replace it with um, positive visualizations and positive self-talk. That's one thing. But also, you, like I said before, you need to calm yourself down. You need to know how to switch off to a fight or flight. And also, if, if there's any trauma, well, then you have to deal with that too. So there's different levels here, not just mm. one simple solution. So you're saying that if something actually happened to me, that causes this trauma, this embarrassment, and you know the way the way you put it, that it doesn't have to be this major thing it can be the uh you know getting laughed at in class or no one laughed at your joke which um you know you might say is not going to change the world one way or the other but it can change your world um so something like that it doesn't have to be this major traumatic event you know necessarily but um the brain can't differentiate between or doesn't differentiate between the fantasy that we might also play with that because that's a big one that I get into a lot of times with, um, I guess I would call it like um, imposter syndrome where I kind of like start thinking, it happens a lot with my job. I, I teach high school English and sometimes like, you know, there's a lot of puzzles to solve in that line of work and um, difficult situations and challenging you know, you're dealing with just so many people all the time. And every once in a while, I'll find myself going down this like whirlpool of like, there's no way I'm qualified to do this. And how did I fool all these people? And then I start playing out the fantasy of the newspaper headlines of me getting caught, like phony teacher exposed and all this <laughs> kind of stuff. And <laughs> yeah. the fantasy is often very traumatic. And so we, it does similar damage is what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's not going to be as bad as a real trauma, but it can be really, really negative. It, and it definitely can impact you negatively. I mean, I can totally relate with that. I mean, I've had the actual trauma plus the anxiety as well. So I also did, you know, um, many, even now to this day, you know, every once in a while I will catch myself going into the, oh God, you know, I, I don't know enough. Oh God, you know, I, I don't think of what if I would be found out, but I'm kind of like, always have to be perfect 
like to try to be perfect because that's like um, that's a defense against uh-huh. possible criticism. So if you're perfect, then you can't be criticized. But of course, perfection doesn't exist. So then you know it's a it's a very it's a lot of pressure, and then that can actually cause. Uh, more problems because then if you feel so so much pressure to have to prove that you are good enough it's like then then you can't relax and if you can't relax then you, you know all sorts of things will happen like you'll forget stuff you will perform badly you know even if you've um uh practice your your piece forever and ever it doesn't matter if you've got that kind of pressure on you you can actually do badly so so yeah, this this kind of uh, you know a thinking, this imagining, this uh, this imagining bad scenarios in which uh, you're not good enough and you are found out and, and all of that, that can be detrimental. Now, of course, it will happen, but the important thing is to catch it and not feed it. You know, right. not feed it with um, more of uh, you know putting fuel to the fire and thinking of more possibilities in which you will find out. It's more like becoming really aware that oh, I'm doing the thing. You know, I'm doing that thing I do where I imagine the worst. Oh, gee, okay, take a deep breath, calm myself down, stop this. This is this is bullshit. You know, this is what I. I've I've done many times before. It's not the truth. Okay, what is the truth? And then what is it that I, you know, um, really need to focus on? What's helpful here? And it's like, well, what's helpful is that you know I may not be perfect, but I do. Basically, all that's required is for me to do my best and give a hundred percent, you know, and really be real. Um, okay, that's that's that I can do. You know, it's so it's focusing on what you can do and the the. It's not about, you know, grandiosity, saying to yourself, oh, I'm the best, you know, because, of course, you know, who's the best at what? It depends, you know. Right. But more like being uh, actually acknowledging what you do know, acknowledging what you don't know, and seeing it as normal because we are constantly learning new things, you know, and, and being totally um, transparent about that because there's no shame around not knowing something, about not being perfect, yeah? Right. Um, so that's kind of what needs to happen then. But that's what positive talk is all about. You know, I really believe that it doesn't need to be over the top because if it is over the top, you're not really going to believe it, you know? You're not going to believe that, oh, you're the best of the best of the best. It's like there's a voice in your head going, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, it's it's not true. And instead, what can you do? Well, you could say to yourself something like, you know, the more I do this, the better a teacher I become or the more I um, focus on... Um, on on being a better producer, the better producer I'll become, or the better performer I'll become, and the calmer I am, the better I'll perform. You know, this this kind of things, and also thinking about all the times in which you actually did well. You know, don't let's not forget that because we're very very wired to always think about the negative. Again, evolutionarily speaking, that makes sense because if you want to survive, you have to constantly scan the environment for dangers. But that's that kind of uh, you know behavior has saved our lives, but it's also making uh, making us miserable now that we don't have all these dangers. We're still looking for all the dangers all the time. So right. we need to like rein it back, become aware of it, and go okay, right? Let's calm down. Let's you know rebalance the situation and and see him for what it is. You know, I am not the worst producer in the world. I'm not the worst teacher or performer in the world. I'm not the best either. I'm just you know, I I do my best. And let's celebrate what I do do well. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, it does those sorts of thoughts do help me a little over time as I get more experience. I can say, well, I've gotten out of this before. I've figured this out before. Um, you you mentioned we have to learn to shut off flight or f- uh, flight or fight, right? Yeah. Um, do you have any? techniques for that because i know when a person is in that state you know that's a very hard thing to shake because it is a it's an intense moment and there's a lot of feelings going on and you said like it kind of shuts off the logical thinking so um you know i've 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 failed many times trying to reason to people and reason to myself and that um what is a good way to try to switch that off 
Well, the good news is it doesn't actually, it's not that difficult once you actually know what to do. And there's like two main ways of doing this, but I need to kind of explain how it works. Because when, you, when you're in fight or flight, basically you, your sympathetic nervous system is switched on. But we also have the parasympathetic nervous system. And that's responsible for us going to sleep, for example, and relaxing, right? Now, the two cannot be on at the same time. It's like a double switch. Either it's one is on the, or the other one is on. It's like you I mean, can't have a panic Can I ask you what sleeping. the sympathetic one is about? So the sympathetic one is is, uh, is what the one that's connected to the amygdala, so the the... Uh, the, the alarm center of the brain, and it's the one that is switched on when you are in danger, right? Would so when that you're be in danger, kind of the yeah. animalistic, like primitive yeah. brain. Okay. Yeah. So it's like um, it's basically what happens is there's imagine an alarm going off, you know, and there's this threat, and what happens is that you get ready, like I said before, to fight or to fly to the enemy. And you, um, you know, adrenaline gets pumped into the body and stress hormones get, get uh, pumped into the body. You get ready to, to have all these um, energy, you know, to, to fight or to run away. Um, but the thing is also that if you, you know, if you don't use this energy, because of course, imagine that, you know, if, you, if you're performing, you might use the energy and channel it through the performance and then and that will make the performance really good could be amazing. Um, in fact, if you're not scared at all, usually you, you get these performances that are kind of like blah, you know, you, you don't really care. Mm. And it's not very not very interesting for people to watch. Um, as long as it's not too much, a little bit of fear is actually good. Um, but then um, the other thing that can happen um, is that if you cannot if you cannot channel this energy for whatever reason, maybe you're a producer and you know you're just kind of sharing your work and, and you're you know you got nothing else to um, no way to to really diffuse uh, all of these hormones that are coming in and you know the stress hormones adrenaline and they're in your body. Then what can happen is that because they've got nowhere to go, then you can start hyperventilating and you know what um, can happen is an actual panic attack, right? Um, and so you got to stop this alarm. You have to convince the brain that you are not in danger. Um, in order to convince the brain you're not in danger, the best way to do it is to switch on the parasympathetic nervous system. Because like I said before, if one is on, the other is off, right? Now, there's um, two main ways of um, of doing this. One is kind of well-known. The other is not so well-known. So um, the one that's not so well-known is... <laughs> It's actually the most kind of natural is the one that we used when we were in actual danger situations, and that's aerobic exercise. So aerobic exercise could just be running up and down the stairs uh, 10 times or doing jumping jacks or dancing to, to a really high energy beat for five minutes. But basically, what you, what happens when you do that? It's uh, it emulates what would actually happen in reality out there. If there was a lion, you know, you run away from the lion, you engage in aerobic exercise, or you fight the enemy. So then, after you've done that, then basically what's happening is that you're you then it's time to relax, right? You've done this, you've defeated the enemy, you're alive now. Ah, and then your parasympathetic nervous system comes comes in and goes, okay, time to rest, right? So that's one way of doing it. And I find it is very, very good to do that. Um, it can really work. Of course, you know, sometimes you might not be able to do it, but it could be just going to the bathroom and doing your jumping jacks in the bathroom. You know, no one sees you. You could do that, right? That's why but all those guys are doing jumping jacks in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> but you got to do it for like at least five minutes because your heart rate needs to go up. It needs to be enough for your system to, to think, okay, we're fighting this enemy, you know, this is happening now. So that the adrenaline gets used, the stress hormones get used, uh, and then you can relax. Um, the other one, um, and you can do both, like you could do this other one after the aerobic exercise, or you could do it instead of. I find that it's kind of better to do it after if you can, but if you can't, then um, this one also works. Um, it just needs to take your time. It needs to be uh, five minutes again. Can't be less. And what it is is the um, diaphragmatic breathing. Now, diaphragmatic breathing basically is uh, simple, but you need to learn how to do it because if you are in a panic, it will be hard to do. 
unless you have practiced it before. Because when you're in a panic, you take shallow breaths. It's, it's very difficult to take deep breaths if you haven't never done it. It's very unnatural. You know, you just feel like breathing really fast and really shallow. So um, diaphragmatic breathing basically is when you breathe in with your nose and you keep your mouth closed. So you take a deep breath in. You hold that breath for a couple of seconds and then you breathe out through your nose very slowly and you keep your mouth closed very slowly. So a trick is to count. So you could count, for example, up to four. You breathe in one, two, three, four. You stop maybe one, two, three, four and then out and you go lo longer, eight, maybe 11, you know, as long as you can. And you repeat this for five minutes at least, yeah? So after that time, what is happening is, this is to do with the amount of oxygen in your body, like you need to, to have your mouth closed because if you do that, you know, without going into the detail, I explained it in my book, but uh, basically you're not having enough oxygen in your body. And so when you are, um, when you are having a um, hyperventilation episode, like you're panicking, uh, not enough oxygen goes where it needs to go to the tissues and that's another thing that needs to stop so when you breathe like this you engage the parasympathetic nervous system and also you stop hyperventilation right so this these are the most important things to do and then once you come well then that's the perfect time to do to to engage in positive empowering affirmation self talk Things that you can believe, like I said before, you know, it's, someone else might tell you affirmations that make no sense to you. Uh, you need to come up with your own. It's much better to come up with your own. Um, uh, and, you know, I've got a way to do that again in my book, which is, you know, I think it's much more pers much better if you it's personal. So something that you really can believe. And there's other things as well um, that can make then the performance even better. But um I don't know if you want me to, to tell you about that, but we can go there. You know, once you're calm and you're grounded and you and you um, are engaging in this positive self-talk, then there's other things that can make it even better where you're like present and, ah, you know, you're really there. You really can give 100%. You're really connected to your music because the other thing that I've, I guess I really want to say that I forgot to say is that we think that uh, making music is about us and it, yes it is but on the other hand when you share your music it's no longer about you right when it's when you perform your music or you share it it's not about you anymore no one cares what people want is to feel something and so all they really want is to have an experience that they wouldn't have had before without this music right so your job is actually to be egoless in a way you know to be a hollow reed to be a conduit a channel for this beautiful or whatever it is this energy that's running through you right the more the egoless you are the more hollow you are the more pure um this energy can can run through you and the more you can really like express uh the music through you so you become an instrument yeah but it's not really about you you know i mean for you it is about you but for other people it's not. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah, you're like, you're there to just channel it and supply it. But it's not, let's watch you go through your emotion, like what you really are. You're trying to communicate that and share that emotion and create the emotional impact on people. Yeah. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I like that people that just, yeah. thinking yeah, would cool. probably pull you out of your own head too, where it's kind of not, the point isn't me and no. what I'm doing the point for me is to just be the vehicle exactly yeah and uh, and you know we all share feelings we all have as humans similar experiences emotionally and what people want to do is to be connected to that experience that maybe in ordinary life they just don't get a chance to really go there and so through your music they get to go there. That's what the music is for. Whether it is like a dance track that really gets you going and you're like, ah, forget about your day job and you're really into this music and you're like 
in ecstasy, you know, or whether it's like a meditative space where you, you get to really be calm and connected to this like spiritual experience or whether it's like a heartache song and, and you get to like really connect to what it's like to have your heart broken and maybe, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. We all share these experiences, but it's hard for, for us, you know, for the audience uh, sometimes to go there alone. And that's why music uh, brings them there. Mm. That's a good point because a lot of the songs like I can think of that have connected with me in my life, I sort of apply my situation to. I don't then picture the artist like, you know, breaking up with his girlfriend <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and yeah, driving yeah. away in his car. It's like, I'm the one doing that. I'm there and I, I feel it and I connect because that's what happened. Yeah. And um, it you said something that made me just kind of realize like um, we, we all like to connect with each other. And I, I'm finding, I think, more and more that the stuff that uh, stresses us out the most and worries us the most, like, what's wrong with me? Why do I feel this way? Why am I having trouble getting on stage? Why, why am I scared to put my music out? Look, all these other people do it. Um, those seem to be almost the most universal. The more weird it makes me feel, <laughs> the more it like, connects with other people. Yeah, because it, no one cares, to, you know, no one wants a perfect person out there to be like, I am an, like a robot, you know, who's, uh, who's perfect and never gets anything wrong. And you, know, you can't relate to someone like that. In fact, the more vulnerable someone is, the more relatable they are. And so you think, oh, okay, this is a normal person like me. They're insecure, like I'm insecure and it's okay. So the thing is actually this person being like that gives you permission that's what's happening. Mm. It allows you to be also insecure sometimes. And it basically saying, it's okay, you know, you don't have to be perfect. Stop even trying because actually, who, you know, we are not perfect. Everybody has the same worries and insecurities. So it's very much like makes you feel better, you know, that, yeah, uh, it's <laughs> this idea that we have to be um, someone we're not. It's just something to let go of, you know, and to just embrace who you actually are. It's mm. it's not a dif it's a difficult thing to do because we are told we're not good enough all the time. I mean, we live in a society as well, like without going like into politics, but we we live in a capitalist society, and capitalist society really is about like if you look at ads. The ads are basically trying to manipulate you all the time, saying, you know, buy this because if you don't, then you're not good enough. You know, like you're not good enough as you are. Just, but if you buy this, you might be. <laughs> and so yeah. it's like indirectly feeding our insecurity. Hmm. Yeah, that. That's, and we've, I don't know how many thousands of ads we're said to see like every year of our lives. By the time kids are like 18, they've seen like millions, which is yeah. so many more interactions than they'd have with positive influences like parents or friends yeah and they, yeah, there absolutely. is the subtext of like you could be better if you had this you know. yeah yeah i mean i decided 25 years ago to stop watching tv and i haven't watched tv i mean i watch films but uh but i don't watch tv because uh it goes into your head like whether you like it mm. or not that's bad hypnosis that's why it's basically yeah. hypnosis but right. it's bad hypnosis you know and so you, you find yourself in the supermarket getting that thing, you know, the toothpaste, whatever that you saw on TV, just because you're familiar, because we work with familiarity. You know, that's why repetition works. Even if, you know, someone, if someone says to you many, many times, all the time, oh, you're not good enough. Oh, you're useless. Oh, you're, you're going to remember it. You know, you're going to remember it and you're going to think it's reality. Um, if someone says to you, oh, you, you're great, like since you're like a kid, Oh, you're, you, you're destined for great things. You, you're really smart. You, you're going to believe it. You know, it's all about repetition. So ads and it are just another form of self-hypnosis. Mm. And, and, and that's what's going to, and that's basically what feeds your, your, um, your self-talk and your self-talk shapes your identity. So then, you know, whether you have a high self-esteem, low self-esteem, it is influenced by all these um, external um, input, this external input, you know. Uh, so I think it's also important to kind of protect 
that and uh, be wary and uh, sur- try to surround yourself with more positive input. It, it doesn't mean that, you know, you're, it's going to be unrealistic and only yes people around you, but more like being aware and uh, discerning, you know, um, mm. of that input. Mm. Now, as we go on in our world these days i mean we're seeing more and more of this and it's more and more catered to us like when you go on your social media you go on the internet even it knows what you looked at on amazon it knows it knows what you're worried about it knows that like thing i typed into google when no one was looking and it it feeds it back to you um yeah yeah are you worried about just people in general and well i am actually Uh, i i am and um it's you know i've seen even with myself um you know you're talking about you know google whatever like all all this social media and and, uh, the internet like knowing what we like and um the problem with that you know i I used to think well you know who cares you know they're just giving you like uh an ad uh, about something you're interested in what's the problem about that well the thing is okay it might not be a problem for that moment but if you decide that you actually want to do something else that you want to change you know or if you fall into a rabbit hole of like i don't know conspiracy theories or whatever and the algorithm tells you constantly about all these conspiracy theories you're going to believe it you know it's just a repetition um that's that's hypnosis like i said and if you were even lucky lucky enough to suddenly have a you know epiphany and go oh gee no actually i don't want to be like this the problem is that well the algorithm keeps on feeding you that stuff so it's really hard to actually say no it's because we we are um again wired to do the easy thing you know so make so they make it really easy to continue to do this thing that you don't want to do anymore so you have to be super super aware and it takes quite a lot of um, you know awareness and consciousness and effort you know to be like stop enough Mm. delete 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 you know and we'll take some time to then go in another direction and weirdly enough this is a mirror of what happens in the brain you know because when we are basically our brain is plastic and there's always this neural pathways being created and the neural pathways get reinforced the more you go down um, a specific path and the more you make a certain choice then it becomes more uh, familiar it's almost like imagine that you're going down a path that's in, in a forest where it's snowing and the more you go down that path the easier it is because the snow is being you know pushed aside and and then in order to actually go on another path, you have to make quite a lot of effort, you know, to get mm-hmm. the snow away. And then eventually, if you go down this path a few times, then the other one is going to get covered with snow, so to speak, you know. But it takes a lot of, you know, a lot of repetition. So the worry is, uh, unfortunately, as human beings, we are not really, again, wired to do the difficult thing. We're wired to do the easy thing. And this is the main worry for me, you know, because we we behave in this automatic way. Uh, Once we start a habit, we keep on going on to that habit, usually unless something really bad happens, you know, and it takes an illness or or something awful, you know, to actually go, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I don't want to do this anymore, you know? Mm. So like, you know, if you decide to, I don't know, eat junk food you know like and you're eating junk food forever and ever for years and years and years you know it maybe it takes a heart attack or maybe it takes you know an illness to be like oh actually you know wait a minute i should i should make better choices and it's not going to be easy so um hope that answers your question yeah and it makes sense if you think about it from an evolutionary standpoint because make it, if you had to make those decisions every single time that's a lot of energy. That's a lot of brain power. So it conserves energy for you to just do the thing you worked because you're still alive. So it must have worked somewhat for you. But to to constantly change it would be overload for the brain, I think. And yeah, but that's why you got to be. You got to take some time off social media and off all these inputs to create a bit of silence and space, mm-hmm. you know, so that you can reconnect with yourself and actually check in and go. Is this path I'm going into, you know, 100 miles an hour without thinking, is this what I want to go? Is this what I really want to do? Because if not, well, I can make another decision. I mean, this is what makes us different from, I don't know, like uh, a cat who, you know, 
probably doesn't think about, you know, um, these sort of things, you know, and just repeats the same behavior every day that, that un unless so something bad happens and stops them, them from doing that, you know, but as human beings, we just like a cat, a dog, a chimpanzee and all of them un until we take the moment to be conscious and be like, actually, uh -huh. I want to do something else. That's the, I, in my mind, that's the only difference really. And maybe one day cats will do it too. I don't know. But, you know, at the moment, that's what we have the power to do. But a lot of us don't do it. You know, we just sort of go into this ham, you know, um, in this wheel, like, like a hamster on a wheel, you know, just keep going, keep going, you know, never stop, never stop. Uh, and that's the danger. You got to stop and ponder and go, okay, is this what I want? Right. And I guess that could apply to you know, the performance thing with your, with your music, you keep playing that same, I, I think of this as almost like playing a DVD in my head. And when I get this, like, I'm not good enough. I have no right doing this. Who am I to be talking about making music? Why have this production podcast? What am I, what gives me the right, you know? Um, I think of it as like, I put in a movie, like a DVD and it's called, I'm not good enough. I'm terrible. And I'm worthless human being. If I can catch myself, doing that notice my thoughts i can stop the dvd take it out and put in the other one that says no man you're cool you got this you've done this before you know you'll figure it out and that was really something that came from just doing meditation and paying attention to my own thinking and noticing how i'm thinking because i i see it as like there's a guy in my head talking to me constantly and that's my mind just thinking stuff and sometimes they're not saying nice things and they're not helping me. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's hard to notice it because I think most of the time I have no idea. I'm just in this trance. But um, yeah. the more I practice, it's, the yeah, more I yeah. notice. It's conditioning, you know. It's, it's like we learn how to talk to ourselves the way we were talked to when we were kids by other people. Often that's how we learn it. Also, right. you know, some people are more kind of, uh, tend to be more optimistic and some people more pessimistic, you know, and, and, and all of that. And it is, it is a bit of a movie, you know, it is, it's, uh, it's that part of you that's trying to, you know, it's trying to help you, but it's just doing it in this way that uh, it's not quite, it's, it's a bit dysfunctional, you know. So for right. example, if you're, parents or people at our school or whoever, you know, um, use, uh, you know, a critical language, you learn to talk to yourself in the same way, y you become your own parent, your own teacher, your own bully. Yeah. And, and, um, and I think the important thing is to, again, realize it, have compassion for yourself. So rather than fight it, you know, just be like, okay, can I have, can I be kind to myself? Can I be more compassionate and understand, oh, you know, I'm doing this thing that I'm used to doing, but actually I can choose to be a bit more kind. And and also see behind behind the harsh words because that part of you has is trying to help. It's just it's doing it in this bad way, mm -hmm. you know, with these words. And so we almost have to become a bit of a translator and go like, okay, what, you, what is this part really trying to tell me? Like maybe this part is just trying to, make sure that I'm protected. Usually it, it tries to protect us with this perfectionism or, you know, um, sometimes by avoidance, you know, oh, you know, the, don't do it because you, you, you'll fail, you know. Well, actually, it's trying to, to protect us from the pain of failure, right? Mm -hmm. But it's like, oh, okay, so that's, that's part of me is trying to protect me. Okay. But actually, you know, failing is fine. Like, you then have to change, you know, what, the message is around failure then. Oh, okay, failure is, failure is fine because it's steps, you know, that you, you, you get to you get to get better by failing. I mean, if you think about a baby, a baby that's trying to learn how to walk the first few times, the baby won't get it right, you know, but does the baby go, oh, I'm not good enough, I'll never walk again, you know? The baby goes, oh, I've, you know, I messed up. Now I'm, I'm let's try this other thing, you know, and then maybe fails again and then oh but doesn't give up and it keeps going and that's how you learn how to walk but it, then we're conditioned you know to say to be we're told oh no you have to get it right the first time maybe you know and it's that's bullshit yeah so then we have to uh notice that translate the message 
and and start talking to ourselves in a in a more kind, helpful way, and go like, okay, well, failure is actually a step towards learning. It's a companion. It's totally like it's never gonna go away. It's actually there to teach me something. It's teaching me to be better. That's actually what failure is doing. It's teaching me to be better. Okay, right. Well, now nah, then it doesn't matter if I fail. You know, if I fail, I should just you know learn the lesson and you know laugh a little because you know that's that's what we do. We we mess up. It's kind of funny, you know. And then learn from it. You know, how many times have I made a mistake in a, a, during a gig and I used to be like, oh my God, I made a mistake, I'm terrible. And then it would make it worse, you know, and right. the people would be like, oh God, gee, get over it. It wasn't that bad. Uh, but I still have to say to myself, and this time I'm much better, much better uh, these days uh, at kind of noticing it and kind of laughing it off and be like, oh, you know, oh, the wrong chord, ha, 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 you know, and just move on, you know. Yeah. That's what the best performers usually do. They just kind of laugh it off. Yeah. I've seen it where they don't laugh it off and <laughs> it's it's ugly, you know, and it, it makes everyone <laughs> uncomfortable. It makes it 10 times worse. Yeah. And um, yeah, I've messed up a million times. Every time I play, there's some mistake that goes wrong. Um, hopefully they're not catastrophic, but I've had a few. And um, the best thing you can do is just like you said, don't take it so seriously. I mean, it's probably not that big a deal. I mean, my shows weren't that big a deal. It wasn't like I was on live television or anything. Um, but even still, I think we get, there's something charming about that. When when something goes wrong and it's handled gracefully and it's handled with yeah. humor. and Because we can all kind of, as you, as you said before, we see ourselves in this. So we can all imagine that like horror and that embarrassment and then to see somebody kind of shrug it off, laugh, as you said earlier too, like it gives us that permission. You know, it's, yeah, exactly. It's a nice, um, and, and I think that's the fun of seeing stuff live and seeing performances is there is that danger and well, what's going to happen? What if, what yeah. if? And um, it's, it's, you know, of course it's terrifying, <laughs> but um, I guess what else are you going to do really? Also, you get better the more you do it, but the more mm. you do it in the right way. Like, you know, when people say, just just go and do it. Well, mm, it depends. If you go and do it in a negative way, like you constantly think, oh God, I'm going to be terrible. Oh, I need mm. to be perfect. You know, I've done this. I did this for like 10 years and it was so bad. Like I just hated performing and I just almost went, okay, that's it. This isn't for me. I'm not going to do it anymore. Um and and then realize oh i my attitude is is wrong like i'm doing it in this negative way but actually what you got to do is think about it in more positive terms like think about the best time you had you know the best performance you had the ones where you actually have fun keyword fun cuz it's got to be fun cuz if you're not having fun the the audience isn't going to have fun mm. you know your job is to take care of the audience you're there to serve them mm. you're there to serve them it's not about you it's about them so are they comfortable they're going to be comfortable if you're comfortable are they having fun they're going to have fun if you're having fun if you're not having fun then at least acknowledge you're not having fun you know and and at least be real about that and be like ha 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 I'm a bit nervous hoo hoo you know you can use that energy again and just don't make it a, you know the, the end of the world and then through that, you'll actually get, you relax a little bit. You know, maybe we'll all laugh about how awkward I'm feeling right now. And then, you know, um, the more you can do that and have an okay experience and then even have a good experience, the more, the faster you're going to become um, just uh, relaxed about it. Because if you think about it, again, uh, for example, uh, people who defuse bombs, Right? There's people whose job is to defuse bombs. Now, that's actually dangerous. They could lose their life. But you don't see them tremble like with that, you know, with the, with the wire and be like, uh, you know, with, what if I get it wrong? They don't do that. They're very, very calm. And the reason is they have done this forever. They've repeated it so many times that the brain got the message, oh, this is, this is not dangerous, right? So you got to repeat a positive experience enough times for your brain to get the message, this is actually not dangerous. And here comes a bit of a shortcut. So for example, if you've had a negative experience 
many times now so you're in a way traumatized right um then what you need to do is repeat the positive experience but that can be quite difficult to do in reality right um because you get triggered a lot you know and, and that could take quite a long time to calm yourself and and learn all these techniques one way that you can do it faster is to use hypnosis or guided meditation i mean hypnosis and guided meditation um are pretty much the same thing it's just how you induce the state and what you do with it and the important thing to do is to use mental rehearsal so positive mental rehearsal like you mentioned the film there where you make a positive movie in your head you think about all the ways in which you want um, yourself to actually feel during the performance you imagine it with detail you think about you know how your voice is going to be what you want you know not what you don't want and you uh, imagine, you know, how your body is going to, uh, you know, how are, how are you standing? Uh, are you smiling? Uh, how, what are you feeling? And you really imagine it in detail. And you do this and repeat it again and again and again. Because remember that your brain doesn't see the difference between what you imagine and what actually happens. So this is the trick. This is why hypnosis or garden meditation works. If you do it like this, then you it's a shortcut because you're really training your, your brain to have a good experience. And then when you go out there, it's easier because you have got a, a model, you know, and you can remember that. And, uh, and, and so then it becomes a lot easier to actually have a real, real experience, positive experience. And the real and the imaginary marry each other and they help the conscious and the unconscious marry each other. And that's when you progress much faster. Hmm. So you play it out in your head, really. You, yeah, that, exactly. Th that's the imagination is pretty powerful, and um, there's a lot of talk about like visualization of your goals and to like really go into detail. And I, th I, I think there's definitely degrees of um, realism to that. You know, there's some people that think you can just imagine it, things to happen, and you can sit back and wait. But I no. think there's something to be said about making it real. So putting those details in there, thinking yeah. about what it's going to be like, it makes it seem less of a fantasy, which yeah. changes your thinking into, I could probably do this. And this is what it would be like when I do that. Yeah. I mean, the key, the reason why you want to imagine it really well is because you want to elicit an emotional response. That's what's going to make the difference is the emotional mm. response. If you, you, you know, if you imagine something in detail, you're more likely to actually feel the positive feeling. Mm. And when you feel the positive feeling, there you have it. Then now you've got something that's going to actually make a difference. Of course, you have to still take action. You know, you do need to go out there and actually do it. You, need, you do need to go out there and actually remember, think about this positive experience that's what's going to work. If you don't do anything, if you don't take action, well, nothing's going to happen. It's not magic, mm. you know, it's just right. psychology. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, that's, that sounds like a great strategy and very helpful. Um, and the idea of just in kind of embracing these things and recognizing them, um, even like what you said about fear earlier. I read a great book called The Gift of Fear. Okay. And it talked like you know we often think about fear is bad you said failure if we failure is bad but fear it, it, again evolutionary stuff that's why we're here because if we weren't afraid of the lion we didn't have children and, and <laughs> you know all, all our descendants don't exist so yeah um it's it's a protective thing and i think even when we have those self doubt it is we're trying to save ourselves from the embarrassment and the shame um, but I guess knowing its place, right? Like you said, you gotta keep it in check a little bit and not, yeah, let you it gotta, be you know, you gotta not let it drive the car. You know, it's like mm -hmm. the fear is going to be in the car. All right. It's always going to be in the car, but it's not driving. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, if fear wants to drive, you're like, ah, 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 no, you go in the back seat. You know, mm -hmm. you're not going to let the fear decide where you're going. But you want it there. So I don't decide you to want go it there. 200 miles an hour off of bridge to see what exactly. happens <laughs> exactly <laughs> right exactly yeah that's true yeah. that's fun that's a good way to think of it like i like that car metaphor because uh yeah and all this stuff is with us i i think 
we can get a lot of stress and kind of this like feedback loop when we fight it. If we have anxiety, oh no, I have it. Oh no, I'm scared. What am I going to do? I'm, that makes you more scared. Yeah. Yeah. Just not having fear is, is okay, you know, but it's about letting it run the show, or, uh, you know, or whether you're in charge, you know, who's in charge? Is it the fear or is it you? You know, if we if we weren't afraid, we wouldn't be courageous because courage is uh, having fear and doing the thing anyway, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, without fear, it's kind of like, meh, you know, it could be actually dangerous or it could be just boring. You know, a performance could be just like, life um luck life i remember when i i tried to get over performance anxiety and i took beta blockers and it was just terrible like i wasn't afraid but i was just like a robot mm -hmm. and uh, there was like no feeling in me i was just like there singing and not connected to myself to the song just mm -hmm. like a robot you know and that's that's not good either so it's like uh, the extremes are like not caring or getting um, completely like buying the fear. I mean, like, oh, yes, yes, it is dangerous. Oh, yes, 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 I'm afraid. Therefore, it must be dangerous. It's, it's believing your feelings without actually thinking at all hmm. about them, right? So you got to acknowledge the feeling, feel the feeling, and then, you know, in this case, there's things you can do about to diffuse the fear, definitely, and, and then go out there and do it, um, trying to... Calm, like I said, you need to be calm as much as possible so that you can then ground yourself, think about what you want rather than what you don't, and then use, channel this energy in positive ways. Hmm. I have kind of a stupid story that was a, kind of a big moment in my life, oddly enough. Um, I went to a haunted house with my wife and her friends and... Um, you know, one of these things where you go and they jump out from and scare you and running around with a chainsaw and all this <laughs> stuff. And I just never went to those types of things. Wasn't into it. I was like, I really don't feel like having these people jump scaring me and all that. So we went through this thing and I was able to like shut off and I just walked through it like a zombie and nothing Effect. I knew people were going to be jumping out, it was loud noises, flashing lights, whatever, Frankenstein, all these things. I was able to like numb myself to it. And when I got out, I felt like really good about myself. You know, I was like, yeah, I see how you do that. Uh -huh. um, but one of the guys I was with was like, no, what are you doing? That's not the point of this. Like, you're supposed to feel it, like, get into it, let it scare you. And, you know, he gave me this like pep talk. And we went to the next one and I'm not, and then this one, I was like looking around, having fun, like getting scared where you're supposed to get scared and creeping around. I had such a better time. And it's, it's because I like let it all in, you know, the good and the bad yeah. of it. And the first time it was like, I mean, it was like a waste of my life, really. Like, what's the point of going through something if you're not going to get anything out of it you're just going to go numb mm. to it um yeah and also you know fear and excitement are processed by the brain in exactly the same way so actually it's the same thing you know it's uh, it's a little trick here that uh, you can do for example if you um you know say that you obviously you're married and everything but you know say that you weren't and uh, you weren't on a date and you wanted to uh, trick a girl into liking you probably you could do that by going and seeing a scary movie and that like a really scary movie um, and that the fear uh, would be interpreted as excitement because it's the same thing you know and then you would like the person might actually end up um, associating you know you the experience they had with you with excitement right Mm -hmm. So this just shows you that uh, obviously you know I, I don't I'm not saying go manipulate people <laughs> I'm just saying that that's that's a proof that it you know it happens um, and and so one thing that you can remind yourself of as well is that uh, fear is just excitement you know instead of saying I'm scared you just go I'm excited this is exciting of course because it matters to me that's what I'm feeling right now so you're reframing it as excitement. Mm. Well, we do a lot of things like that, right? Like the haunted house is exactly that. It's safe yeah. fear. It's exciting. Roller coasters are like that. Um, oh, yes. You know, 
I guess, driving in fast cars and all those things we do for thrill. Yeah, you know, yeah. Thrill. But there are some people that are scared of fear, right? Mm -hmm. They don't want to feel it. So you're saying embrace it. Yes, you have to embrace it because if, you're, if you don't embrace it, if you refuse it, mm. then it's got this crazy power over you. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Let me... Jeez, I had to mute myself a second ago. I thought I was going to get away with it, but uh, do you mind if I just put her upstairs? No, go ahead. I'll be, go I'll be ahead right and I'll back. Put, I'll put some juice in my headphones. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, sorry about that. Jeez. No problem. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I guess it's not unusual, though. They bark at everything. <laughs> yeah. They're good, though. Um, let me see here. There's something I wanted to ask you about. Um, oh, I know what it is. Let's put a marker here so I remember where we were. Okay. <laughs> We're back. We're back. <clears throat> I wanted to ask you a little bit about meditation and hypnosis. And you said they're kind of very similar, just how you access them is different. Um, maybe the first thing I can ask you is what what is meditation like for you? How do you see it? Um, I know there's so many misconceptions about it. And um, I think that's one of the biggest barriers people have to it is usually based on a misconception, but um, maybe yeah. you can kind of talk about that for a second, just because then sure. I want to hear how that uh, goes with hypnosis, which is something I don't have any experience with. Yeah, so I said um, the difference is, is two things. It's how you induce it, but also what you do with it. Uh, they're quite different. Um, uh, meditation can be uh, contemplative or concentrative. So com contemplative is like straightforward you know you contemplate um, either an external object or an internal image so um, or it could be an internal feeling you know like you mindfulness you know for example as like you are focusing on uh, being aware of your thoughts as they appear in consciousness um, you are learning how to direct your attention to um these thoughts to, to being a, basically aware that you're having thoughts, that you're having feelings, that you're having sensations rather than being completely lost uh, within them and identifying with them. That's like a major um, kind of objective of meditation is to learn to be aware that you're aware, right? Mm -hmm. That's like mindfulness, basically. But then there's like different other, other types, uh, which are more concentrative and more similar to hypnosis. So they concentrate on mantras, you know, on specific sounds or specific images, specific, you know, like um, uh, it could be, you know, some, some, uh, sometimes if it's a religious kind of meditation, it could be a deity or, or in some, you know, new age kind of meditations, it could be uh, visualizing, I don't know, a chakra or something. Now, uh, the difference with hypnosis is that in hypnosis, you have an objective, a very specific one. You, you're like... You want something to change. You want to feel confident. You want to, I don't know, have a higher self-esteem. You know, you want to perform better at, for example. And, and then everything that uh, you are doing is directed at creating an experience where you feel confident, for example. Um, there's many different tools, techniques you can do. Like, you know, for example, if you uh, if you have a trauma, you might have to um, to do certain things that um, vis usually visually, where you um, detag the experience that was traumatizing, um, so that it's not classified as a threat anymore, and it becomes more like a story of something that happened to you, and that you're now okay about because you survived. You know, there's many, many, many things you could do in an hypnosis, and it's 
is not just simply mental rehearsal, right? But mental rehearsal is one technique that you could use. Um, often hypnosis is is not directed um, by yourself, like you you often have someone else uh, helping you because simply because it's it's quite difficult to do self hypnosis unless you're really advanced because you have to have a modicum of consciousness still there like you know your conscious self needs to kind of direct your unconscious self and that's quite difficult to do without losing the subconscious part you know like becoming too um you know back to your normal kind of conscious awareness and monkey mind and all of that so you what you want to do is, is to be more in a subconscious experience which is kind of similar to for example if you went to the theater and you were really really engrossed in the show that you were watching and you are not aware anymore of uh, maybe your breathing you know you or, or the person next to you 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 totally end the story you know you're there and it can happen of course as you're if you're a performer and you really enter the performance you kind of forget what's happening outside and you, you're just so engrossed that you know time flies and all of that right. so that so, so basically what you do with hypnosis is more focused um, and there's a variety of techniques. It's not just visualization, right? Guided me, guided meditation is similar in that basically often it's a form of basically hypnosis where the the person, the the the, the guide is telling you what to imagine, you know. And that's very much what the hypnotist does is telling you what to imagine. Um, and to do it on your own, um, it depends, you know, if you really. If you've had uh, uh, an hypnotherapist, a good one, you know, uh, showing you uh, what to imagine and how to frame it, then you can do it yourself. Um, but if you've never done it before, it's pretty hard to kind of suddenly figure it out. And with meditation, you know, it's hard to, again, I think you need to have some kind of guidance at first, you know, to just explain how to do it. You know, um, if you're really don't know how to do it at all like the the typical thing that that usually guides you know meditator meditation guides uh, or teachers do is that they get you to pay attention to your breath now i remember when i first started this i started meditation many years ago i was like so annoyed by that you know because i had this really and i still have a really strong monkey mind right and um i found it so boring you know my monkey mind just went came in and went no, I don't want to do that. That's stupid. You know, mm. I, well, I'm just wasting my time. There's so many other things I could be thinking of, you know, and then blah, 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 blah. And then I would start thinking about all these negative, horrible things, you know, just because I'm quite negative. You know, we're all quite, you know, most of us are quite negative, but I'm, I'm pretty negative. You know, I have to like really work to, to stop that because the first thing is just terrible stuff comes into my head or you know, nightmares and, and, and terrible things. So I was, it was traumatizing. It was like, oh my God, I don't want to do meditation ever again. <laughs> so it took quite a long time to, to actually realize, ah, oh, you know, the point of meditation is not to not have thoughts. It's to notice the kind of thoughts you have and to, and to become detached from them, you know, to realize that you are not your thoughts you know, you are not your mind, you are not your sensations. These are things that are happening in your awareness, but you are the the awareness that is aware, if that makes sense. Mm. So my experience with meditation has been a very uh, kind of on and off. You know, I, I found hypnosis better for me, especially when someone else does it to me. It's much easier for me to shut up, shut up the monkey mind and to listen to someone else follow that you know then i'm concentrating on what they're saying and it's it's a lot easier for me to do that than to do actual meditation so even when i now do guided meditation um that's done by people that are not hypnotherapists you know maybe they're spiritual teachers or whatever i always do kind of secular meditation because I, i'm not really into i don't know i don't really believe in angels and things like that you know I, I like kind of secular stuff but i i am also spiritual in the sense that i believe that the um the inner voice is is uh the most uh connected to you know um what is universal in all of us uh, you know the, the spirit if you like or or what makes you alive you know it's kind of difficult to explain but um 
So when I listen now to guided meditations, um, I, f I focus on the secular ones and, you know, maybe some Buddhist ones because um, I, I quite agree with the Buddhist philosophy to a certain extent, you know. And I allow that to help me to, f you know, to, to, to become more peaceful um, and to focus on the breath, you know. But the, focusing on the breath is just a concentration exercise, you know, to, to like realize that. Mm. Can you do this, you know, or are you just a victim to your own thoughts? Um, I, I think a lot of people get frustrated with that, like you said, because you really can't focus on your breath. It's kind of impossible, <laughs> even for like one full cycle of in and out. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if I've ever done that. I don't know if I've ever made it through <laughs> a whole breath, but the exercise is always, if you notice that you didn't make, oh, I'm thinking about, you know, skateboards now for some reason. <laughs> um, let's go back um, yeah. to just notice that I'm doing that is powerful, yeah. really, because yeah. you can pick yeah. up and when you And it doesn't have it. to be the breath. You know, it could be mm -hmm. uh, focus on the pen in front of you or the candle, you know. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what it is. And then hypnosis um, someone else is inducing that for you. Now, my, this, it's like probably comically, you know, inaccurate, but it's the picture of like in the movies, like they're swinging the coin or something in front of you mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. follow this, listen to it. Is it, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I imagine that's probably not really how it goes down. Yeah, not really. I mean, you could do it that way, but yeah. not really. I mean, there's many inductions. Like, um, uh, just before I answer that question, though, you can hypnotize yourself. You know, there is such a thing as self-hypnosis. And self-hypnosis, I mean, all hypnosis actually, in the end, self-hypnosis is just that there is a guide. There's someone there helping you, you know. You're always hypnotizing yourself. And it's not someone else doing it for you. If you decided, I don't want this, you, there's no way you could do it. You know, if you said, nah, I don't want to do yeah. it, well, it wouldn't work, right? So, yeah, so first with that caveat, um, yes, there's many ways of, of hypnotizing yourself or to be hypnotized. Um, and yeah, usually it doesn't involve pendulums. Uh, one of the easiest <laughs> techniques, <laughs> one of the easiest techniques uh, is um, to, uh, it's recalling something. So, for example, one of the ones that I kind of made up for myself that, help me helps me fall asleep if i'm having a bad night is to hypnotize myself by closing my eyes and then uh, mentally recalling all of the things that are in my room uh, i usually kind of go you know i've got like a method like i, I would go uh, clockwise or whatever and i start thinking okay what's the shape of the room what's the color of the wall what object is there um you know how many drawers does that dresser have really and and just really engaging in that and it could be that or it could be recalling oh the best time and you know the, the the most beautiful beach you've ever been at, and and, and how wonderful it was to uh, lie on the on the sand and feel the sand on your toes, and and the sound of the of the sea and the breeze and all of that. So what you're doing is engaging your imagination. Whenever you engage your imagination, you're entering hypnosis. It's as simple as that, really. So everything else, all of the other techniques are often aimed at distracting the conscious mind so you can be focused on focus your imagination on all of these experiences mm. and producing an emotion because that's really what the, what does it mm. i guess in a way it, it seems like we're kind of when we're not aware of our thoughts, it is. would you consider that almost like a form of hypnosis when we're just kind of carried away in these? Um, well, we are in a trance, yes. We are in a, in a, in, we have been conditioned at some point to go in one direction, you know, thinking one, in one way. And then we just go with that in this unconscious um, program, you know. Um, this, is, this is the way we do things. This is what, you know, this is how we've always done it. And we are in a bit of a trance. And then actually, you know, you 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 really understand this because because often actually the process is to wake up from the unconscious trance and actually decide to change direction. Like just like we go back to what we were talking about before. We are in this trance of doing things always the same way, the way we were conditioned to do it. And 
and hypnosis is it's positive hypnosis is to break that cycle, recognize what it is, and start a better one, mm. a better program. You know, because we need these programs. Like you said, it's too much to constantly think. You know, like consciously and be here. I mean, it's would be amazing if we could do that, but you know, we can't always do that. Sometimes we have to automate. You know, and but let's automate positively rather than negatively. You know, in a way that is helpful, if you like, mm. than disruptive. Mm. Well, that's, it sounds powerful, and I know meditation has been really helpful for me on, on so many levels. Um, because really, everything that happens to us first gets filtered through our mind and through our thoughts, and I think that's the reason why two people can do the exact same thing and have totally different feelings about it. Like yeah. playing in bands, I've played shows that I thought were great or shows that I thought were terrible and I had a miserable time or a great time. And then the person that was right next to me playing in the same band with me had the complete opposite feeling. And it's like, well, how is that possible? You know, but it's, you know, how we're processing it and what we're thinking about exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah, because there's no such thing really as objective reality. Everything is a subjective experience. Mm. We all, even, you know, the color red, you know, the way you see it is not the way I see it. Mm. It's so weird. <laughs> 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 it's just there's this kind of a fuzzy notion of reality that I have some sense of. Um, but there are times when I'm not sure if that's what I really saw or what I really heard. And you get some sort of confirmation from other people around you with their fuzzy version of reality. And yeah. somehow we have to puzzle it all together. Yeah, you know, reality reality out there, whatever is out there is filtered through our senses and, and through our emotions and, and through our experience, uh, you know, how we have interpreted those stimuli in the past, what it meant. You know, it's mm. not just the thing, it's... What meaning do we give to the thing, you know, to the experience? What is the meaning? And we make meaning all the time, and that's the thing. If we, if our meaning is negative, we have a negative experience. If your meaning is positive, we have a positive experience. So that's how it's possible that the person, you know, has had a terrible time at the concert and you had a great time because your meaning mm. was different from his. Right, yeah. It's definitely worth paying attention to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because um, you, you can get carried away easy. But yeah, I mean, you can change that meaning as well, you know. Yeah. It's like if something happens to you that's really bad, like you break your leg. Well, you've broken your leg, you know, that's, that's the same as if it happens to you or me. But maybe you could make a meaning that's different from mine. Like you, you could be like, Oh my God, this is the end of my life. This is the worst thing that could possibly have happened. And now all these terrible things, uh, the consequences. And you're going to feel terrible, you know, but, mm. you know, nothing's going to change the fact that you, you broke your leg. But you could say to yourself, well, you know, okay, I broke my leg. That's, that's not fun. But, well, how can I use this experience? How can I make it as, as positive as possible? I mean, it's not positive in itself, but maybe, you know, I could use this time watching my favorite TV shows or writing that book I've always wanted to write or, you know, do something else. It doesn't mean that you're not allowed to feel bad about your leg, but it's more like you don't get completely carried away by this negative meaning and you balance it a little bit with like, okay, how could I use this? As, how could I make this a positive experience for me to a degree, hmm. you know? You remind me of probably my favorite line out of like any Shakespeare is in Hamlet. He says, um, there's nothing good or bad in a thing, but thinking makes it so. Oh, and, God, yes. Yeah, and, yeah he's talking <laughs> wow. about his friends are like, Denmark is so beautiful. And Hamlet's like, yeah, right, it's terrible. This, <laughs> he sees it so different. But it's it just applies to everything. Like if it's raining out, I could be upset because I can't have my picnic or glad because my flowers will grow. Yeah. It's yeah. just rain. It's a natural occurrence without any real um, positive or negative side to it. And exactly. Exactly. It is what it is. You know, it's it's not negative or positive. It's not. It's what you make of it. It's what you decide it is. You know, and at the same time, it's not what you decide of it. I mean, in itself, it's, it's neither. Uh, it's mm. not what anyone decides it is. But for you, the experience you have depends on what you say to yourself. It is. Mm. Very true. So 
I think that's a lot of useful information for processing the whole idea of performance, being afraid to perform, or if you, especially if you have a really rough time, because that can mm. that can mess you up a little bit if you, if you let it and if you go down that way of thinking. Um, but I hope that maybe some people listening can take some of this to heart and you know decide if they've been holding off on that release or booking their first show or whatever it might be um, to, to go for it. And, and you said earlier, have fun and we're playing music. We're, yeah. you know, the, that, that experience of having just not taking it so seriously and, and you are not your performance. That's not your self-worth. Um, playing in bands, I, I had to learn like, I am not my guitar part. So mm. if you don't like what I played on guitar, it doesn't mean I'm terrible and you don't like how I play guitar. You just don't like those notes. And even if I think they're the best combination of notes I ever came up with, there's other combinations to come up with and there's other ways to do it. So um, to let go of that, that attachment that of our own self-worth to what we do. Yeah. Um, it's not easy. It's it's, no, it's something no. I think you have to work on constantly. And I'm glad you're helping people through with that because I would imagine that there's probably more good art in the world as a result. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would hope so. Um, you know, one one can only do what one can do, you know, a little bit at a time. Um, but yeah, you know, if um, <clears throat> if you allow performance anxiety to stop you from expressing yourself, well, that's that's a losing game for everyone. You know, the, it's like uh, having this wonderful, beautiful, unique piece of food that no one's going to get to taste, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah. It's your own invention and uh, maybe a hundred people don't like it, but there's one person that likes it. And if you don't put it out there, that person's going to miss out. You, you're not enriching the world, you know. So you want to enrich the world. Mm -hmm. um, all of us have got, I believe, I've got something to offer, no matter what it is. Uh, and so, you know, it's a shame not to do it out of fear, you know, don't let fear be in the driving seat, you know, express mm -hmm. yourself and, and get, try to have fun while doing it. Cause that's at the end of the day, the most important thing. And other people will get something out of it if they're meant to, you know, if it's for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, that's good. Can you tell us about the book and where people can find it? Sure. Um, so the book, well, I'd like to give some copies uh, to your listeners uh, for free. I mean, obviously, you can get the book on Amazon, but if you want it for free, you can get it from uh, my website. So I've made about a link just uh, for your listeners to make it easy. So um, it's um, elisadinapolialtogether.com slash Brian, and they just find the book there. Awesome. Um, That's otherwise, so nice of me. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you're basically, if you just put there to be seen uh, on Google, you'll find it. But this is just if they want it for free. Wow. That's really nice of you, yeah. I, I think um, people should get it. And, you know, um, the, these are... The, the thing that kind of, I guess, is always fascinating, I, it's why I guess I still love making music after all these years, is it's this never-ending challenge. It's this never-ending conquest. And... Um, for all the times I've performed live, there's always a little bit of jitters. There's always a little bit. And I've, I've never really had it too bad. You know, it's never been mm. debilitating or anything, but it's always there. And it's something you have to deal with. Yeah. Um, and as I, was, I said in the beginning, you know, getting ready to release music, it's like, oh my God, I put, we worked so hard on this. Like, it would really hurt if everyone hated it. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think, again, like you have to trust yourself a little bit too, you know. Um, we we did work hard and do our best and it's years and years of, um, you know, effort culminating. And that's the same thing with anybody that's going to perform. You've rehearsed, you've done your part and uh, you've got something worth sharing, as you said. And to not share it is um, it's sad and it's um, unfortunate yeah. for all the people that would probably enjoy it. Yeah, and also, do you love it? You know, mm -hmm. do you think it's great? I mean, that's important, right? Mm -hmm. If you love it, if you think it's amazing, like really being honest with yourself, and you're like, "Damn, this is this is just so good," then 
does it really matter what other people think? Mm. I don't know. I, for me, mm, you know, if I really truly love it and I think it's amazing, of course I want to share it with others. Of course I want other people to love it. But number one, I need to feel satisfied, you know, mm. and this success, um, if, if we put the locus of success inside, then we can never really fail. Mm. Yeah, and I think, I think maybe also there's a, some doubt about whether or not is what I did actually good? Is this performance actually mm -hmm. going to be good? Um, but it's not the end of the world. <laughs> it's yeah. not the worst yeah. thing in the world, believe it or not. Because I, I can tell you from experience to go <laughs> up and bomb and just do oh, a yeah, bad yeah. job and not sing well or miss the chords. Um, sometimes, and I do think a couple of those experiences in my life were actually helpful. You know, like going up mm, yeah, to play. I mean, I have had terrible experiences myself, you know, like I've had one experience in which I was super embarrassed because I, I was just so, it was a few years ago and I was just so uh, nervous that I drank some red wine and I drank too much red wine. So basically I got there and the red wine kicked in and made me completely forget everything, just mm. everything. So in the middle of a song, I suddenly blanked and I could not remember the words, the chords, nothing, just nothing. And there's people were like looking at me like, what's going on? And I'm just like frozen with a head, you know, <laughs> um, head, you know, like rabbit in the headlights type thing. Mm. And I ran out of the, of the place, mm. in, you know, feeling so humiliated. You know, mm. I was like, oh my God, I'll never set foot in this place again. You know, <laughs> like, and now you know i mean it's hilarious really and now i can say it, it's kind of funny you know it, it's kind of funny and it's okay it's like being kind to of myself well i know now not to ever ever drink red wine before a performance because it doesn't work <laughs> <laughs> so that was a success then <laughs> yeah, i learned from that and like nobody remembers anyway who cares yeah. you know i was like pfft. in other people's lives that's nothing right right but like you said in our own minds Mm. It, it might as well be the line. <laughs> yeah, but then now I remember, I'm thinking, okay, well, that time didn't go well, but how about the times that it did go well? How yeah. how fun was that, you know? And is that worth all this effort? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is, because it's amazing. Like, when it goes well, oh, it's just this feeling of, like, being, really being alive, really feeling like you're present in the moment, you know, because that, at the end of the day, a good performance, that's what it is. You've got to be present in the moment, Re to allow the music to flow and to be that all read, you know, you've got to be present. Not being present means you're lost in your head, thinking about what if and this and that. And that's what makes us miserable anyway in everyday life. So it's it's almost like a spiritual experience. Like if you want to be more connected to the present, well, there's no better training than being a musician. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. Music is like that, right? It happens in the moment and then it's gone. Just yeah. Just like that. <laughs> For sure. Well, I thank you for taking the time to share all that. Uh, lots of valuable information. Um, and it's like so many of the good conversations I have on this podcast, we're talking about music, but we can kind of be talking about anything because I think what you're mm -hmm. saying really applies to all aspects of life and everything we do. Um, so we will have everything in the show notes where people can check you out, where they can get the book, Dare to Be Seen, for free, which thank you again. That's really generous of you. Oh, you're welcome. Um, is there any uh, other places you want to send people? I know you mentioned you had some master classes that people can sign yeah, up for. Yeah, so I guess um, I would probably mention that, you know, if you're not the kind of person that reads a book, uh, maybe the other way to, to get into this a bit more deeply is to do my master class, which is also free. And for that, you just go to tinyurl.com, there to be seen master class. So that's tinyurl.com, there to be seen masterclass. Okay. And then I guess uh, the only other thing is, you know, you can check out my music if you want. Uh, and I'll, I can leave a link, uh, you know, it's elisavulpus.com and, uh, you know, just for a different experience. You know, all the things I talk about um, are probably in that, um, you know, expressed through music there. Mm. Perfect. In some way or not. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thanks. So You're welcome. Thanks for taking the time. And I want to say thank you for everyone that's listened in so far. Please go check out Elisa's site. She's got lots of really cool stuff there. Lots of videos on YouTube, too, that are really great that we should point out, too. And pick up the book. Check out the master class. And uh, 
you know, dare to be seen. Get up there, do it, share your work with the world. Make it a better place for it. <laughs> so thank you, everybody, and thank you, too. Have a great day. Hey, if you enjoyed the Music Production Podcast, please consider giving it a review on your favorite podcast provider and share it with a friend, somebody that you think might enjoy the show and get something out of it. That would mean a lot to me. And if you want to check out more of my work, including sound packs, tutorials, etc., head over to brianfunk.com. Thanks so much for listening and have a great day.